Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another chapter of our Bible journey. Today we are in John chapter 4. What a great privilege to just uh, go directly to the source, the source of life, who is Jesus. Just go to the truth, who is Jesus. Jesus is truth, Jesus is the way, and Jesus is our life. And so we are going there and we are journeying and we are just trying to understand what Jesus is saying and talking to people, especially today. Uh, we are going to look at a conversation, the long conversation that we Jesus Christ had with a woman. And uh, those days, uh, men and women were not supposed to be talking in public. And so it was a very uh, surprising thing. But Jesus Christ, you know, he uses every opportunity to show that he is the Messiah. And so we are going to see today. And <clears throat> Jesus Christ has to go through a village of Samarian village, Samaritan village, uh, uh, through Samaria, they say. You know, Samaria is a place where uh, they are half Jewish and half other race, like Assyrian race, they say. So the Jewish people always had an enmity with, with Samaritans. They didn't like them because they were not pure Jewish people. So even today, uh, the Jewish people want to worship in the Temple Mount because they said that's where King Solomon's temple was there and that's where God's presence was there. So Jewish people always are there. Uh, but the, the Samaritans, they worship God in a mount called Mount Gerizim. Even today, once a year, they go and they have a big celebration. And the Samaritans, you know, they, they believe that that's where Solomon built the temple and that's where uh, God was revealed and all. You know, so, so there is this enmity be between them and they don't use talk to each other. They'll have a separate village only for the Samaritans and uh, the northern part of Israel. And, and so a lot of enmity and a lot of anger and fights and everything. So Jesus Christ had to go through that village to go to uh, Galilee. You know, so he's returning from uh, Jerusalem, I believe, uh, and, and he's going to what's Galilee and he has to go through that village. As he's going, you know, the journey those days, they'll be walking, he's thirsty. And so they stop and uh, he says like, you know, uh, can you, uh, uh, Jesus told us, uh, uh, give me a drink, you know, to this lady, you know, because he was thirsty. And in the meantime, his disciples had gone to buy from food, you know, to the nearby village. So only Jesus Christ and that lady is there. And so Jesus says, give me a drink. And then this lady says, how is that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, like I already told you. And Jesus replied, look at verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. See, again, Jesus Christ is talking in a spiritual angle. Like in the last chapter, yesterday we saw about how Nicodemus, he could not understand the words of Jesus Christ, what it means to be born of the Spirit. So he said, should I go back to my mother's womb to be born again? And again, this lady, you know, she doesn't know who Jesus is. Jesus is saying, I will give you living water. But he wanted some little water from that well. And she thought he really wants only that water, but she didn't know who Jesus was. And she says, sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? So look at this, you know, the spiritual words of Jesus Christ are looked at it from a material way of things, you know, physical, scientific, materialistic way of things. Like many times, you know, that's why even we see spiritual truths in the Bible, we always try to understand with our own limited mind and, and physical mind. But you know, the things of the Spirit are revealed to us by the Spirit of God. And the deep things of the Spirit are revealed, to, revealed by Him. And so that's why when we read the Bible and when you're praying, you know, we're always saying, Lord, Spirit of God, you speak to me, you open my heart so I can receive what you have to tell me. And that's what's happening here. This woman is not, does not know, so she's asking these questions. And she says, my father, our father Jacob is like, you know, Jacob the patriarch, you know, he's the, he's the one who gave us and, and he gave us for his life. You know, so he's, are you greater than that, our Jacob? And Jesus says, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. What does it mean? Everyone who drinks from that well will get thirsty again. Because you drink from that well and you walk for one more kilometer, you will start be very thirsty. So the same thing, Jesus is trying to get a message across that this well, the water, the physical water, the water from the world, from that well will make you thirsty again. And isn't it how our life is? Jesus is trying to compare to the well water to the living water. The well water versus the living water. What is the well water? The well water will make you thirsty again. But Jesus says, but whoever 
drinks from the water that I will give him in verse 14 will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Amen and amen. This is the difference, dear brothers and sisters. Is that when I drink from the water of the world, I get thirsty again. Many people have this question. If I could just do this, I will be so happy and satisfied. If I could just get this position, I will be so happy and satisfied. If I can earn a certain amount of money, I will be so happy and satisfied. If I can get that girl or if I can get that boy and marry that person, I will be so happy and satisfied. Many people are you know, going after this, especially in the modern day. It's so easy to fall into addiction. So easy to fall into sin. Sin is always crouching at the door like, like God told to Cain. The same way today with the modern day technology, sin is crouching on our pockets. It's waiting there. We could do anything we want, you know, within a span of a second. And so here many times, you know, people try to find satisfaction in the things that are around them. And when we go and try satisfaction there, maybe it gives a temporary pleasure, it gives a temporary relief, but do you think it satisfies? No. Because I'm thirsty again. I've had many young people come and talk to me and they'll say, brother, I'm a college student and I'm going through this problem and I'm going through this. If I, if I can't talk to that girl, I cannot be, I can't get sleep. If I don't drink this, if I don't do this, I cannot get sleep. I, I need this brother, I'm too addicted now. And, and it is not satisfying because today they drink half liter, they have to drink one liter, they have to drink more to get that, that same level of relief. And this world will not satisfy dear brothers and sisters. So I don't know what is your blank. When I say, what is your blank? If I could just blank, 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 I'll be happy and satisfied. What is in your blank? What are you saying that will satisfy you and make you happy? Many times Satan also lies to us. He says, the pleasures of the world, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. All these things, they think they will satisfy. And many, any of you who have gone through sin, I'm sure many of us have fallen into sin and we've come saved by the grace of God. You know sin doesn't satisfy. You know it is not going to help us. You know, yesterday I was preparing this message. I was sitting in the room and I was watching this uh, honeybees. Uh, the, the, everything was dark outside, so there was a tube light in the room. And because the tube light was there, this honeybees used to come to the tube light. They are making this noise, noise, you know. And then I was getting disturbed and I had to overcome that and I had to keep preparing. And then I, um, I finished my study, went out, went out and then came back again to the room in the morning. I saw all the honeybees dead, fallen dead there in the morning. So what has happened? What was so attractive, what was so bright and attractive and pleasurable, I think, for the honeybee, it led to its death. It had died. And so many times, you know, when we are attracted to these things of this world, but it's definitely not giving us any satisfaction, it is causing a spiritual death. It's taking us far and away from our Lord. And God is there waiting for you to turn back and to confess and come back to him. But, you know, these things that are holding us back to, from having an intimate relationship with Him. And so here Jesus Christ is saying, hey, this water from the well is not going to give you, make you happy. Or it's not going to satisfy you. It's going to make you thirsty again. But Jesus says, behold, the living water that I am going to give you. What, is it, what does it do? Four things. The living water that I will give you, you will never thirst again. You will never thirst again. Never. Jesus saying the word never. When Jesus says never, we better take notice of it. Because he says never. You can find satisfaction in me, is what Jesus is saying. I am enough. Today, many times, you know, people say Jesus plus this. Jesus plus this. I say Jesus only. Jesus only is enough. There is nobody more precious than Jesus who is the mediator between God and man. We can't do anything extra. So, Jesus is saying, I give you, I will give you, and you will never thirst. Amen. So, he is going to give you living water, and you will never thirst again, and only that, it will become a well inside us. So, what happens? There is a well that is inside us. Okay? So, so that's what the verse says, right? There's a well of water springing. So, so what's happened when Jesus, you're drinking, that water that Jesus is giving, I'm drinking, and that water is getting filled in my well, 
and after it's getting filled and filled and filled and it is springing up into eternal life. See, this is the reverse of living water. Jesus said, if anybody who is thirsty, let him come after me. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The exact verse is mentioned here in a different way. So, as Jesus Christ, as we drink from Jesus Christ, and we first we have to realize we are thirsty. You know, that's the thing. First, I had to realize in my life when I was living in sin, I had to realize that I am broken, Lord, I am thirsty. I am trying to go to all these places, different wells to drink water and it's not helping me. And I come to you, Lord, I need your living water. And so I drink from him and I am being replenished, I am being satisfied. And sometimes, you know, I fail, I fall. And then I, I go and drink from the water from the well and I feel like, oh man, it is so bad tasting, it is so salty, it is not enough. I'll come back to God. And then you keep doing this and then you come back to God and say, Lord, I don't want that life, Lord. I don't want that. Because the well is filling and then it goes on to eternal life. And so she said, Lord, in verse 15, women said to him, give me this water so that I won't have to get thirsty and come to draw water. And she's like, look, give me this water, this living water so I don't feel th thirsty. She's still not getting the point. She still does not understand. We have the advantage of knowing everything in hindsight because we are reading this 2000 years later so we know what happened but imagine if i was there even i would be asking this silly questions <laughs> right so so this lady is saying look so give me this water i mean you're promising a great water this promising the water that will never make me thirsty again so please give me that water and uh, jesus you know asks her go call your husband and come back here <laughs> jesus says go call your husband and come back and you know what she says i don't have a husband so I don't know with what intention she said that. Some people say that she had an intention. She wanted to tell to Jesus that she was available. I mean, I don't know what she meant. You know, but I think, you know, she's trying to hide something. She's trying to hide something. And, you know, Jesus is the light. And he will show us who we are. He will show us. And he gently wants to show us. Because why? He paid the price for that thing that we are hiding. That's the most amazing thing about our God. That many times we try to hide from God because we don't need to hide from God. Because Jesus died for that same thing that I'm trying to hide, that same thing that I'm struggling. He died on the cross for that. He put an end to that saying it is finished. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who can raise, who can criticize a child of God? Then they're like, nobody. Nobody, dear brothers and sisters. Don't let yourself criticize you. You come to the Lord. Let the gentleness and the sacrifice and the humility of Jesus Christ drive you to him. And so here, this lady says, you have correctly said, I don't have a husband for you. I, uh, I mean, sorry, sorry. Jesus says, you have correctly said, I don't have a husband. For you have five husbands and the man you, who, who, who you have is not your husband and who you have said is true. And what you have said is true. So Jesus knows everything about us. Jesus knows more about us than what we know about ourselves. So the best thing to go, if you want to know yourself, if you want to find yourself, you don't need to go to a camp and a retreat and like, you know, you don't need to go to like a very quiet place and meditate like for many hours and all. Even though it might be good, I think sometimes. But I'm telling you, go to Christ. Go to Christ. He knows about you more than anybody else. And in my life, you know, I've struggled so many things emotionally. I've, I've gone through so many things that are, was hurting me. My relationships were not right. And um, I used to get angry. I used to get, uh, you know, uh, inferior and superior and all these complexes that we have. And I went to the Lord and said, Lord, fix me, Lord. I need living water, Lord. That's all I want. I want living water. Fix me. Pour out your love into my heart. Pour out your spirit into me, Lord. And I just opened my heart. And God took me through a period of time where, you know, he started to work in my heart. He started to renew. The Bible says the renewal of the spirit of your mind. In Ephesians chapter 4, it happened in my life. And, and so this lady is also happening. The same thing, you know, God's revealing things to her. And as he's revealing things to her, she's like, I see you are a prophet. Suddenly her thing changed. She's like, oh, you're a prophet. You're a prophet. Because you seem to know everything about my life. You need to, you know, everything, every detail about my life. And then you know what she said? Our fathers hosted on this mountain, which is Mount Gerizim. She's pointing to Mount Gerizim. But you Jews 
say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Now she's trying to bring some differences. Hey, no, is Jer Gerizim the right place to worship or Jerusalem the right place to worship? You know what Jesus is saying? Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father and neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He's saying, hey, don't try to put me in a box. Don't try to put me inside a building. Is what Jesus is saying. Don't try to put me inside the building, inside Jerusalem temple. Don't try to put me inside a building, inside the Mount Gerizim. Gerizim. You don't try to localize God. Many times, you know, we, 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 we do that mistake. We think that God is in one place. You know, when I'm, when I'm in church, you know, singing worship songs, you know, God is there. But when I'm uh, driving my car, I'm riding my bike, and I'm um, talking to my wife, talking to my children, at work, at office, you know, we think God's, God is not there. Don't try to put God in one place only. God is everywhere. God is everywhere. And, and that's what Jesus is trying to say. But an hour is coming, verse 23, and now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's the thing, because God is everywhere. Where the spirit of the God is, there is liberty. In 2 Corinthians we read, God is spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So you go wherever you go, in your kitchen, in your living room, in your bedroom, Christ is there. His presence is there. He is always there. He is for us. He is not against us. And so what happens, you know, we just have to learn in Acts chapter 17 verse 28 as Paul says, you know, in him we live, we move and have our being. In Christ we have, we live, in Christ we move, in Christ we have our being. Everything, because you know why? You opened your heart and you've been born of the spirit. When you're born of the spirit like we saw yesterday, the spirit of God is in us and he is working through us. My mind and my objectives, my goals, my ambitions, my future plans, my worries, my anxieties, my fears. Everything is taken care by the Spirit of God. And so here, Jesus is saying, this is how true worshippers. And I am looking for these type of worshippers. These type of worshippers, Jesus is looking, even today, God is looking for those type of worshippers. What type of worshippers? Worshippers who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And so in verse 24, it says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So he says, must, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then the woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Still, she is not convinced. She is saying, hey, Messiah is coming and he will explain everything. He will expose everything to us. And Jesus, you know, amazing verse 26. Look at that verse. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, to you am he. Jesus is publicly declaring that he is the Messiah. He is the Christos. He is the anointed one. He is the anointed one. Dear brothers and sisters, what a great joy. That this lady, she is talking to the source of living water. She is talking to the Messiah without knowing that he is the Messiah. Without knowing that he can give rivers of living water to her. And suddenly the, the disciples came and they were like amazed that Jesus is talking to a woman. And uh, they're asking, Lord, why are you talking to this, talking with her? And immediately the woman, she left her water jar, because that means she's going to come back. She goes to the town and she tells people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. So she said, Jesus told everything about me. My dear brother and sister, Jesus is going to tell everything about your life. He tells you who you are. He tells you what's wrong with you. He tells you what's going on well with you. He tells you how you can improve. He tells you everything that you need for your life. That's why we have the scripture, you know, that, that, that tells us, that, that shows us, it's, it's, it's a mirror to us. It's a mirror and it says, helps us to come and know our Savior. And, and as we go through the Bible, chapter by chapter, you know, God is speaking to us in a systematic way. You know, God is leading us and guiding us. And I believe that the presence of the Lord is upon you as you read the scripture again, that there will be many things that God will tell, many revelations that God will give. And so here we see this lady just heard the message and just went to the village and getting all these people. She's the first, almost like the first missionary, you can say. And she goes there and, and uh, disciples said, Rabbi, eat something now. Teacher, you come and eat something. And Jesus, you know what said, I have food to eat. I have, ha I, have, I have food to eat that you don't know about. <laughs> Jesus says, I am satisfied. I had food to eat already. And they are like, what? You only sent us to get food. Now you are saying that you are already full. And you know, so what Jesus is saying? Uh, they are thinking, could, did someone else buy food for Jesus? 
verse 33 and verse 34 Jesus says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Amen. What a great scripture. The will, the food of Jesus Christ is to do the will of the father and to finish the work that the father has given him. And what is the work that the father has given him? To draw people to Christ. And that he would pay the penalty of the sins upon, take it upon himself and pay the penalty of all the sins. And that is the work that Jesus Christ was called. And that is what he is doing here. And in your life, in my life, what is the call that God's given us? What is the main goal of our life? What is the main purpose of our life? I pray that there are many people today, dear brothers and sisters, in your street, in your homes, in your relatives, who are hungry for God, searching for God. But you know what? They are searching for satisfaction in the wrong places. But they are hungry, yes, all right. But they are looking at it for the wrong places. And, and that's ministry. Ministry is trying to point people to the living water, whoever is looking for satisfaction, whoever is looking for, looking hungrily and thirsting after things, and they're going after the wrong things, hurting themselves. Like that bees, you know, that went to the light and, and is killing themselves. They're killing themselves. Their soul is dying each day. Their spirit is getting dead every each day. They're going deeper and deeper into livelihoods that are away from God. Away from a close and beautiful relationship with God. And so here, what's happening? Jesus is saying, you know, that, that, that we have to do the work that the Lord has sent us. He says, there are still four more months. Don't you, uh, then comes the harvest. Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they're ready for harvest. Is Jesus talking about wheat or uh, vineyards there? Jesus is talking about, see that lady has gone to fetch all the people from the village. They are the harvest. Who's the harvest? The harvest are the people that are coming from that village now. They're going to come and they're going to listen to Jesus Christ. That is the harvest. They're searching for God. They're searching for God in the wrong places. They're searching for God in Mount Gerizim. They're searching for God in Mount Jerusalem, in, on the mountain Jerusalem. But Jesus is saying, no, those who worship the Lord in spirit and truth, the Lord is searching for those type of people. Today, my dear brother and sister, are you worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth? In spirit, saying, spirit of God, I open my heart, you come and teach me and lead me. Worshiping in truth means the word of the Lord, the truth, the Bible is the truth. And we are, are we worshipping the Lord according to the truth of God? Many people have gone away from the Bible and they have been misled and they are not able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Dear brothers and sisters, I tell you that the reaper, the Bible says, the reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. The Bible says some will plant, some will sow, some will reap, you know. But God who causes the growth so, so we are all serving together. You could be, you could never get on a pulpit. You could never play music. You could never do it anything public ministry. You can do private ministry for God. You can do one-on-one -on -one ministry for God. You can do anything. God's spirit is upon you. Who is going to limit you when God's spirit is upon you? When the spirit of God is upon us, you know, there is no limitation. There is no physical limitation. There is no mental or emotional limitation upon us. God is going to pour out his spirit upon us. So we can rejoice together when we see people coming to Christ. One of the great joys of being in ministry is seeing people changed by the power of God. I'm telling you, that is one of the joy. There is no other wages. There is no other joy that comes to see people change. Their hearts change. Our job is not to show people to say, hey, how good I am. No, 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 no. Our job is to say, how good my God is. How awesome my God is. How powerful my God is. How, how amazing my God is. How you can have an intimate relationship with my God. How you can walk with him. How you can do, how, how he's going to work through you. And that's a life testimony. Don't say, look what I have done. Say, look what God has done in me. Look what God has done in me. Look God how he's changed me. Look God what God's doing in me. Look what God's working through me. That's the greatest testimony. It's not about what we do. It's about what God does through us. And we'll read, you know, I'll close. We have only five more minutes left, you know. Verse 39 to 42. This lady, you know, she goes and many people come. 
Now many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of what the woman told, she testified. He told me everything that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him and stay two days. And many, many more believed because of what he said. And they told the women, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard from ourselves and know that really is the, he really is the savior of the world. Amen. See, there are two ways. One is, first they came because she said, she said. And the second, they believe because of what Jesus said himself. So the ministry means, first we go and tell that Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah, he is the savior of the world, and then Jesus will take care. So it is a, it's a partnership business. It's like, you know, ministry is like partnering with God. So we go and tell what God's done. And second thing, when they come to Christ, Christ will do his work, what he wants to do in their life. Okay. So our, life, our job like this woman is to bring people, point people in the right direction and Christ will come and clarify the message to them. That's why, you know, it's very important when, when, when we bring unbelievers to Christ, we bring them, but we also point them to the scripture. Because when we point them to the truth of the scripture, Christ will speak to them and Christ will take care of them. And that's very important. So the first is, they said that believed, they believed Jesus because of what she told. Second, they are saying, now you don't need to tell us, now we believe because that Jesus himself has told. What a great um, pattern for ministry work. Okay, so the last passage we'll read and we'll close today. 43 to 54, as Jesus is coming towards Canaan, Cana in Galilee where he did the miracle uh, of the, in the marriage feast, there's a second miracle he does of the healing of an official. There was an official, we don't know whether it's a Roman official or a Jewish official, but he's there and his son, he says, uh, he came down and pleaded with Jesus to come down and heal his son since he was about to die. He was on a dying stage. All the hope is gone. Just imagine the heart of a father watching his son die. I mean, that thing should never happen to anybody. That's one of the worst things that can happen. It's a terrible thing. And it's what's happening to this man. He's pleading Jesus. Lord, you come. Lord, you come. His plan was to take Jesus with him 20 miles, travel with him 20 miles, almost 30 kilometers, travel with him for 30 kilometers and bring him to his house so he can heal his son. But you know what Jesus said? Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. <laughs> Jesus was telling because they were not believing. There are not many believers. So Jesus thought that this, this man will give up. But this man said, Sir, come down before my boy dies. Sir, Lord, please, Lord, stop talking, Lord. Please come so that uh, my boy will die. So please come down. And you know what Jesus says in verse 50? Go, your son will live. The man believed what Jesus said and departed. What a beautiful verse, beautiful verse. Jesus said, go, your son will live. And then, you know what happened? He listens to Jesus. He goes immediately. He doesn't say, Lord, 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 please come. Please come, Lord. If you come, it will be more powerful. If you come there and physically, you know, my son, only then he'll be healed. No, no, no. He absolutely believed the words of Jesus and he starts walking. Walking 30 kilometers back. And he probably, it is a long way distance. You know, he comes home and, you know, he comes home and the, the, he, the son is doing, he's alive and doing well. And he comes and asks his people, what time, what time did he, did he yesterday? They said one o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. This is the seventh hour. He got well. And he realized that the one o'clock only Jesus Christ said, your son shall live. Amen. What a great God we serve. When Jesus spoke, the son got healed. Jesus didn't even need to come there directly. When Jesus speaks, healing happens. The Bible says, Lord, he spoke his word and he healed me. God spoke the word. Lord, send your word and heal me. And so today, let's come to him by faith. Whatever is the dead situation in our life, let God speak life into it. Let it become alive in the name of Jesus. Let Christ become alive in you. Let Christ comes and takes sanctuary in your heart. And that we can be alive. Dear brothers and sisters, don't look at your sin. Don't be guilty again and again. Don't be condemned in your heart. Just look at Jesus. He is saying, go, your son will live. And let's go take that word by faith and say, Lord... Lord, make my dead situation alive. Lord, there I've, I've been dead in certain areas in my life. Lord, make me alive, Lord. Let the Spirit of the Lord come and make me alive. Breathe your life, Lord, into my life. So what all we saw today? We saw about chapter 4, about Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, the water from the well and the water that Jesus Christ gives. And we also saw about how to worship the Lord in spirit and truth, what it means. And we also saw about harvest doing ministry for God, and how this woman, the first missionary almost, 
you know, she went and brought the whole town and the whole town, almost many people in the town were saved. And we saw about the healing of this official son. When Jesus says, go, your son will be alive. What a great chapter, right? Awesome. Every chapter is amazing in its own way. We just pray God, pray to God and ask, us, ask him to bless this truth. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives, Lord. We open up our hearts today. We open up our hearts to what we are seeing, Lord, in the scriptures. Every day we see, Lord, there are new things, Lord, that we learn. Holy Spirit, reveal many more things, Lord, to us. Lord, help us to come to you. Lord, help us to drink from you. Help us to be satisfied in you, Lord. Lord, help us to know the, the failure of drinking from the world, drinking from the flesh. Help us to know the greatness, the satisfaction that comes, Lord, from drinking from you. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to keep coming to you, Lord, to drink. Lord, especially, Lord, brothers and sisters who made a decision today. I pray, Lord, that you be upon them, lead them and guide them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray.